What things cause wars and fights among us? I mean, that's the million-dollar question today, is it not, in our world? In fact, that's a question that you would hear discussed on any talk radio program, like Air Talk with Larry Mantle. I don't know if any of you listened to that or not. And if you did, they'd have, they'd have a panel of experts talking about it, wouldn't they? And they'd have uh, someone with, everyone would have a different explanation, a different answer for why there is all this war, struggle, and fighting in the world. So, for example, you might have... Uh, well, he, he's actually passed away, so you couldn't have him now, but uh, you might have Christopher Hitchens, uh, who believes that, and I quote, religion poisons everything. <laughs> great subtitle for his book, God is Not Great. So he says, and I, I quote, religion is violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism, tribalism, bigotry. He goes on. <laughs> That's his explanation. Or maybe you would have someone like, and just dream with me here, uh, like a historical figure, you know, meeting of the minds, like a Karl Marx, for example. I haven't read the Communist Manifesto in a while, but he would say something like, uh, you know, the problem is the, is the distribution of wealth and income equality and the way that, uh, that industry exploits labor. That might be his nutshell uh, explanation. Or maybe you would have, you know what they would have? They would have a really current figure, maybe a controversial one. Maybe someone like, uh, like my friend, Rob Bell, who is my friend, by the way. Rob's explanation is a little different uh, from those two, admittedly. He says it has something to do with the lack of love. If we could get everyone to love his neighbor, then what would happen? Love wins, right? We would have peace. Well, let me ask you a question. What do all these explanations have in common? They're all partly right. Rob Bell's right? What? <laughs> They're all partly right. There's an element of truth in all these explanations, isn't there? Hitchens? Marx, Bell, you name it, they're partly right. But they're also all completely wrong because they didn't address the deepest problem, did they? Not according to this text. I mean, if everyone loved, learned to love his neighbor, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? But in my opinion, peace would still be elusive because we haven't addressed the deepest problem. The lack of love is not the deepest problem. The problem is far deeper and uglier. Listen, the trouble outside comes from a problem inside. The trouble outside comes from a problem inside. And that's what we see James saying. You know, he has another explanation, doesn't he? for the source of fighting in the world. He describes it in a very organic way. Look, there's a lot in that text that I'm not going to talk about. But he starts at the surface, and he, then he moves deeper and deeper, doesn't he, in these sort of concentric circles, sort of like you're going into Dante's Inferno or something. It gets worse and worse as you go to the bottom. But I can discern uh, three steps in his diagnosis, three, uh, three problems uh, that are related and uh, are really overlapping. Three steps. So I'll identify them this way. First, the problem between us. And secondly, the problem around us. And third, the problem within us. So first, the problem between us. Second, the problem around us. And third, the problem within us. Then I want to conclude today by giving you the antidote to those problems. So first, the problem between us is a problem of self Interest, self-interest. Our lives tend to be governed by our desires. I think, uh, as Daniel read it, the Greek word, or the English word, it's translated passions, but the word is hedonai, the Greek word, which you should recognize because it's the basis of our word hedonism. And we think of that as the pursuit of pleasure, uh, debauchery, that kind of thing. But it can mean, in the Bible, it can mean any selfish pursuit, any selfish uh, ambition. See, here's the deal. There is a circle of self-interest that surrounds me. There's a circle of self-interest. 
And so, you know, when you come into my circle, the first question that I will ask myself, if I'm honest, is, what do I want or need from you? That's what I ask when you come into my circle. What do I want or need from you? We're motivated by self-interest, and you've entered my circle. That's the baseline of our existence. And everything in my circle of self-interest, everything and everyone there is, is at my disposal to serve me. That's the baseline of our existence. Now, I don't have to go far to see this uh, played out because I have two children in my home. How many of you have children in your home? If you have two, then it, you, you'll see this played out. Um, my son Drake is seven and my daughter Ivy is four and a half. So when, when Drake found out that my wife was pregnant, I mean, he was, you know, he was so happy. In fact, he'd walk up to my wife's stomach and he'd say, Ivy, come out. Ivy, come out, because he wanted to play with her so bad. But she's born, and all of that changes in real time, does it not? Because now they're seven and four and a half, and so I'll hear happy playing in the next room, and I can almost count it down by 10, ten seconds, nine, eight, before I hear a wail from Ivy, and I know exactly what happened. He, they were playing, he snatched something away from her, maybe without even thinking about it, because she's in his circle of self-interest. Everything there is at his disposal to serve him. Self-interest governs our lives. See, the problem, and I don't want to jump too far forward here, but is that there is a hole in our hearts, is there not? So we use everything and anything to plug it up, but it never quite works, and we're never quite satisfied, you know? You keep filling up with a good thing, but it never takes the hunger away, does it? You know, when you have a hole in the bottom of your soul, <laughs> newsflash, you're never filled. For example, how can we live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world and still be so dissatisfied? You ever thought about that? How can we have everything that we want and yet never have enough? I mean, is it the fault of, dare I say, capitalism? I mean, here you have an economic system that is based on self-interest. Do you understand that? and that excels at creating consumers and, and inflaming appetites. That's how it operates. Reread Adam Smith. Reread The Wealth of Nations. You know, I, it's funny that people still want to debate whether or not this was ever a so-called Christian nation because none of those people would ever want to defend this as a so-called Christian economy. Now, don't go home and tell your parents or your roommates that the guy at Talbot was a communist because it's not the case. but don't think for a second that you aren't impacted by it. Self-interest is the water in which you are swimming every day, and it can't help but diffuse into your entire being like osmosis without you even noticing it. In fact, <laughs> I was leading worship at a large conference some time ago where Dallas Willard was speaking, and you know what he said? He said consumerism is the number one problem in the evangelical church in America. The number one problem. You think there's any connection there? Is it the fault of capitalism or is it just related to our desires within us, self-interest? Well, that's a whole other talk, isn't it? But the trouble outside comes from a problem inside. So first, the problem between us is a problem of self-interest. But you see that it goes deeper, doesn't it? He's going down in these circles. And he, the second, the problem around us is a problem of idolatry. You see that there. Our desires tend to lead us to idolatry. Now, the word I, for, for, I think, Daniel read, it was translated um, desire. In other, in other translations, it's lust. But is the Greek word that you need to know. It's the Greek word epithumia. It's usually translated evil desires. Paul usually uses it often. But I like to follow the way that Tim Keller renders this word as 
mega desire, okay, or over desire. Uh, Keller explains, and I quote, it is not the desire for something evil, but an over desire for something good that leads to evil. And his point that he makes is that idolatry comes from taking a good thing and trying to make it into the ultimate thing in your life. This point's well taken. I mean, there's an incompleteness. Don't you feel it in your life? Isn't there a missing piece that we're on this quest for to plug this hole? We're easy prey for idolatry. Do you know the lie of an idol? Here's what it sounds like. I am all that you need. I am all that you need. I will satisfy you, and I will do it forever. I will complete you. That's the lie of an idol. You heard that whisper before? You know, for guys like Kenny and me, we hear that. Anytime we walk into a guitar store, because I see that Gibson Les Paul hanging on the wall, and it's so beautiful. And it's, oh, did you, it's, it's calling my name. Did you hear it? It's calling me by name. It's saying, Dan, I will make you the perfect musician. I am, isn't that what it says? Am I right? It says, I am all you need. I will satisfy you. I'll do it forever. I will complete you. Maybe you've heard that voice in another arena, maybe in the arena of romantic relationships. You know, uh, I would say in this country, we cultivate an idolatry of romance. And it is so widespread that we can't even tell the real thing from the fake. I mean, in terms of idolatry, it's the water in which we're swimming. Do you understand? I don't know if you remember the movie Jerry Maguire. Some of you are too young for it, but others will. But you, you, can't, you can't not know the last, the most famous line. You know, Tom Cruise is standing in the, in the living room of Renee, Renee Zellweger, and he's making this last desperate appeal for her love. And what does he say? He delivers this line that we love because it sounds so good and because it just scratches the right spot, doesn't it? He says, you complete me. Tom, in three years, I got news for you. She won't complete you anymore. That's the lie of an idol, okay? If you hear that, you should run, not walk the other way. Now, idolatry, as we see here, is, is expressed in Scripture as unfaithfulness to God. James is drawing on a, on a familiar Old Testament image of God, not as father, but as husband, you see, in this text. That's the second step. So whenever you talk about God as being jealous, you enter into that territory, now, Talbot students, if you've studied this passage, you know that line about God being jealous, that's very difficult to translate. You look at 10 different commentaries, you'll see 10 different readings. But let me tell you, you don't call someone an adulterer or an adulteress without going there. The problem is not just between us, it's between us and God as well, right? In fact, I think the greatest hoax the devil may have pulled on the evangelical church in the 20th century is making us believe that idols were just graven images and that we don't have a problem with that anymore. Thankfully, we're getting past that. The problem around us is a problem of idolatry, but the trouble inside comes, I'm sorry, the trouble outside comes from a problem inside. And yet it goes deeper still, doesn't it? Problem between us, Problem of self-interest. Problem around us, problem of idolatry. But the problem within us is a problem of what? You can say it out. Pride. You see it there? It's the most unexpected thing in the passage. He's going along and all of a sudden he takes this right turn. The problem within us is a problem of pride. Our desires are motivated by pride. Look how he quotes from Proverbs. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And that's actually in the dead center of this passage. That, so if you know, 
if you're a Talbot student, take note of that. The number one issue behind the evil that exists in this world is something so deep within us that we have difficulty even seeing it in ourselves. Let me, let me tell you something. If you don't hear anything else I say to you today, hear this. Are you ready? Pride is one of the most dangerous sins because it is often completely invisible to ourselves. How do you see pride in yourself? You're going to step outside of yourself and take a look? No, it's often completely invisible. And like cancer, it will attach itself to everything that you do. Now, other sins you can see more easily. Gluttony, lust, they manifest themselves in a more obvious way. But pride you can't see. And it will metastasize into every area of your life until it's too late and the damage is done. You know, the funny thing is that Christopher Hitchens is partly right. Religion has often caused wars and fighting in the world, and when it does, it is because pride, like cancer, has attached itself to it. We can get so worked up about other sins, but that's the one we should be most worried about. Here's a thought experiment for you. Imagine a person who's 100% correct on his doctrine. That's what we strive for here, right? Yet it's filled with pride. Now imagine someone who is a little off, maybe, on his theology, but is humble. Okay, well, on the basis of this text, who does God oppose? Let me tell you something. I've been in ministry for 20 years, over. And over the course of that time, in all candor, I will say to you, every mistake that I have made has been in some way connected with pride. That's a sobering thought for me, and I don't think I'm alone. So is there any hope for us? Any hope for me? Do I have a stage four pride diagnosis? Well, if the trouble outside comes from a problem inside, then change must come from the inside out, and here it is. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You see that? The antidote is grace. There's this profound link between humility and grace that we see. Um, the antidote is grace. Now, you may look at this and say, well, no, the antidote is humility. Well, how do you put on humility? Do you just walk outside one day and say, I think I'm going to be humble today? I mean, if pride is invisible, doesn't it stand to reason that humility is as well? You don't will yourself to be humble. Someone or something creates humility in you. That is a work of grace. So grace must humble you. There are 10 imperatives in the second section of this text. And no, I'm not going to make those the next 10 points. So just relax. But I'm going to draw your attention to one as we conclude. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Now, that phrase has become so overused that it almost has no meaning for us anymore. But let's keep something in mind. Drawing near to God in the Old Testament was a dangerous and costly affair. You didn't do this lightly. Animals had to die. And you wouldn't draw near unless all the preparations had been made, would you? Well, for you to draw near, grace has to go before you. The only way you draw near is by grace. Grace has to humble you. You have to realize that you are spiritually bankrupt, that you have nothing to cling to except the cross of Calvary and Jesus Christ. You have to recognize your complete unworthiness and Christ's extreme worthiness. Amen? Like I would reread the text this way. Draw near to him, for he has gone before you in grace. Jesus Christ made the first move on the cross of Calvary. 
I mean, that kind of humility and grace in Jesus Christ changes things deeply and permanently. We have to lift high the cross in our lives. In fact, as an aside, I would say to you, I personally think that the humility of Jesus Christ in going to the cross must have been an absolute shock to the devil, you know? I mean, here's this being, presumably an angel of light, who fell because of, mm, I don't know, pride. And then he sees Jesus. Along comes Jesus. Puts the interests of others above his own. What a shock. In fact, I personally believe that humility takes the wind out of the sails of evil. I think it may be the greatest weapon that we possess to combat evil in the world. The humility of Christians and it began with the humility of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. You know, we think that we need all kinds of power to stand against evil. Friends, we totally underestimate the power of humility in Christian people. I think we could do more to change this world by humility than all of our posturing and arguing and debating on Facebook or other places could ever do. Listen, God is changing the world one humble person at a time, and he does it by grace. So here's my prescription for you. Here's my prescription for me. It has been for 20 years. Are you ready? Repent early and often in your life. Repent early and often. It took me 20 years to learn that. In fact, and I share this illustration with a little bit of trepidation, but you'll understand. There's a sign downstairs in the men's restroom, in one of the stalls. It says, well, it may be gone now. It says, the plumbing is old, flush early and often. You'll forgive me if I make the connection. I make the connection because if I say that, you won't forget what I say next. Repent early and often. When the Holy Spirit gives you the opportunity to see the truth of who you are, to see your pride, then you should say, thank you for that gift, Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for going before me and helping me to grow in grace because God is changing the world one humble person at a time, and he goes before you in grace. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.